przedstawienie i cieszę się, że mogę tutaj być i pokazać coś, czym się ostatnio zajmujemy. Mam, tak jak mówił Maciek, trzy slajdy o sobie, także takie krótkie wprowadzenie powiem. Jestem świadom, że chyba mało kto zna mnie tutaj w Panie, także powiem coś o sobie. Jeśli chodzi o edukację, to kończyłem Politechnikę. W 2001 i cały czas byłem w Japonii do tej pory, praktycznie do, do grudnia zeszłego roku. Kończyłem studia w Tokio, no i później um, byłem rok czasu jako postdoc w takim instytucie NICT, a później w Kyoto University, w Uniwersytecie w Kyoto, no i obecnie jestem na Uniwersytecie w Innsbrucku w Austrii, tak jak Maciek powiedział wcześniej. Um, także miałem jeszcze um, okazję być um, afiliowany z innymi instytutami w Japonii, tak jak widzicie tutaj dosyć całe moje akademickie, że tak powiem, cała moja historia akademicka była praktycznie w Japonii, teraz wróciłem do Europy, do Austrii, no i chciałbym mieć także kontakt z polskimi instytutami, ponieważ znacznie bliżej teraz jestem niż wcześniej. Czym się zajmuję? Głównie jest to szeroko rozumiane NLP, ale także z information retrieval, z wyszukiwaniem informacji. Właściwie to taki mixture, połączenie tych dwóch rzeczy, a bardziej szczególnie czym się zajmuję to takim computational history, czy, czy analiza tekstów pod względem elementów czasowych, czy, czy różnych takich temporal obiektów czasowych powiedzmy, ale także jak widzicie inne tematy to są sumaryzacja dokumentów, timeline summarization, contrastive multimedia ocean, o, o, i ocena także wiarygodności tekstów, credibility i tak dalej, ale to, czy, to czym się dzisiaj będziemy zajmować to jest właśnie pierwszy punkt, czyli analiza tekstu i wyszukiwanie tekstu pod względem czasowym, że tak można powiedzieć. I więcej informacji możecie znaleźć na mojej stronie. I ostatnią rzecz, jeśli chodzi o siebie, to chciałem powiedzieć, czym się zajmuję, jeśli chodzi o community, bo to zawsze ważne jest dla nas. Organizuję konferencje iCuddle um, oraz TPDL, to są Digital Library Conferences, konferencje, przepraszam, które właśnie się zajmują tematyką archiwistyczną, um, digital humanities i tak dalej, na którym zresztą też Maciek był w tamtym roku i jak widzicie także organizuje workshopy. Jeden będzie na ACL w 2021, czy w tym roku um, i będzie to workshop na temat um, zmiany słów, historycznej zmiany znaczenia słów, um, historical language change i jest jeszcze możliwość wysłania um, papierów, jeżeli ktoś się tym zajmuje uh, na ten workshop. Um, także chciałem wam po powiedzieć także, czym się zajmuję, jeśli chodzi o community activities um, i to byłoby tyle na temat uh, mojej własnej osoby. I teraz uh, zacznę mówić uh, na temat dzisiejszej prezentacji. Chciałbym tylko spytać się, czy będzie to ok, jeżeli będę mówił po angielsku, ponieważ um, Właśnie doszedłem do, do wniosku, że jest to chyba moja pierwsza polska prezentacja e, od czasów magisterskich i po prostu ciężko byłoby znaleźć mi um, odpowiednie słowa. Um, oczywiście pytania, czy, czy jakąś później dyskusję możemy prowadzić po polsku, ale czy byłoby to ok, jeżeli będę kontrolował po angielsku teraz. Jeśli, jeśli ktoś jest e, przeciw, powiedzieć. Ok, wydaje mi się, że chyba um, można kontynuować po angielsku. Przepraszam za to. E, dobrze, także uh, today's agenda, uh, question answering in news archives will be my first um, topic. Then uh, I, I will talk about temporal analogs in news archives. And finally, if I will fi find some time, I will talk about uh, interactive demos, which are related to these two topics. Um, but let, let me give you some general background uh, on, on the research. Um, direction that we have. So um, we focus on archives, archival data, and indeed there are many archives these days. We have newspaper archives, book archives, uh, even web archives, social media or product review archives, which are examples of born digital uh, content. 
And all this data is, is of course, um, quite large and spun different types of document genres. And the, this is kind of heritage for us. It's, it's quite important and it, it's continuously growing. The archives are just getting bigger. And we have a lot of uh, data in digital form, which you can utilize for a variety of purposes. And just to give you some numbers, um, for example, the project uh, Chronicling America is a project of uh, digitizing and gathering together newspaper uh, pages about America. They have about 5 million uh, pages. Uh, Times Digital Archive has many news articles over 200 years about. Then there is Internet Archive, Google the Books, and so on. And of course, many national libraries and archives, they have their own digital collections. Lots of money is spent on it. For example, in Japan, um, 140 billion yen was just spent on digitization in National Diet Library. Uh, however, the, the usage is still not so uh, high. We have a lot of fantastic, great data, but the data is mainly used by professionals. For average users, um, this is difficult to access this data. And uh, basically, the, the, the uh, amount of data, data and, and huge cost, which were put to produce data. So the goal of, of our research is to provide novel kind of accesses to this kind of data and make it useful and uh, accessible to everyone, not only to professionals. Of course, we also focus on professionals like historians, journalists, um, scientists, but we also want uh, average public to, to access all the documents, to appreciate them, uh, derive some knowledge, and so on. And I probably don't need to explain that history is important uh, for us. Um, it's a subject taught in elementary schools and onwards in, in education. It's preparing us for life in the society and so on. And these days we have um, many computational approaches to history termed in general digital history, digital humanities, which is using computational power to support analysis, writing, usage and studying of history. And our research to some extent falls into this um, direction. Um, so, currently, if we can visualize document archive, let's say a news archive, um, the access uh, is, is in, a sim in a simple search uh, style as we have on the web. For example, the user might have a query uh, like portable music devices in 1980s and, and then search results are returned ranked according to the query. They can be accessed but as you can guess it's rather difficult to make sense of results we need something more user friendly and more um embracing the the characteristics of the archive which are temporal characteristic and uh different context issues over time and so on the challenges for providing some kind of easy access is that data is large distributed over time and the vocabulary change over time. Uh, I will show some demos at the end of the presentation to 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 let you know what what things we can visualize about changing semantics of of words over time. And also, what is I think important is that users don't know the past and the context uh, in the past. So, if we, for example, tell some information from 1920s, let's say, uh, probably few people know about political situation at the time who was the president, who was prime minister, which political parties were in opposition to each other, and, and so many other pieces of context which we want to also provide to users um, and, and let them understand uh, the history. Of course, this is a bigger picture and we, um, we focus on particular problems, uh, which is a question answering that I will soon start talking about. But in general, the, um, the question is how can we effectively extract information from archives and present to average users and make it easy for users to um, derive some knowledge. So let me move on to uh, the first uh, topic, which is question answering in news archives. And um, the examples of questions that we uh, focus at are shown in this table. For example, um, what what bill was signed by Clinton for firearms purchases? And the name is Bradley Bill. 
this is the answer and the event is from uh, November 93. So all these kind of free open questions we want to process given a large uh, news archive that can span millions of uh, news articles and um, we would like to, to have correct answer uh, delivered. What are the applications of that kind of research? Journalists, um, historians, even ordinary users can um, utilize this kind of uh, system. And to, to give some more evidence of potential applicability, I want to mention that the paper that we published um, last year uh, got uh, uh, industrial impact uh, paper honorable mention, which was given by um, committee from, uh, from industry. So I think this has some potential. For example, insurance companies or um, other companies that have a lot of text uh, want to probably answer some questions about events uh, in the past. And question, uh, question answering is, of course, now novel, it's well-established field of NLP. Um, however, most systems work on Wikipedia or on recent news, not on archives. And typically, in most of the cases, uh, the input is just a, a document. It can be a long document and the question the question that has to be answered based on the document. In our case, we don't have any one document, we just have an entire archive. The answer is somewhere there, but we don't know where. And uh, of course, this is about the past. So the context change, the words can change, uh, the, the meaning of words even can change over time and so on. So there are many challenges and we first divided the questions uh, into explicitly time scoped questions which are shown here. Basically, these uh, questions have some temporal expression. For example, um, you can see November 2003 or April 94. So basically, there is a time expression in the question already. That's why it's called ex explicitly time scoped a question. The other uh, category are implicitly time scoped questions, which are obviously much more difficult. Uh, to process, but also more interesting, more challenging, and that is what we focus mainly uh, on. However, we also provide solutions for the, the first type of questions uh, as well. So um, the system which we build is called KANA, Question Answering in News Archives. And um, I'm sorry, uh, I think I just closed my presentation by mistake. Can you still see, this, see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, I cannot show see my own slides now. Uh, okay, now I can. Yes. Um, just a second. Yes. So uh, Kana and um, basically um, in a in a um, crude overview, the question comes from the user. The system is routing this question to underlying search engine which um, provides uh, some candidate answers and, and the answer is derived from them. And we use for the experiments New York Times archive that spans about 20 years. Uh, and uh, this, this document collection has about uh, 1.8 billion news articles. It's frequently used for many researchers on temporal IR and other kind of uh, research. And um, the main component of our system is a document retrieval module, which is this kind of search engine from the, uh, that has access to archive, um, then the time aware re-ranking module and document reader module. The, uh, the middle one is actually a component that we added to typical pipeline uh, of question answering systems. And that is where our research uh, sits. Uh, this is a component that basically helps to find candidate documents uh, that can contain the answer. It's, it's some kind of re-ranking more from IR side than from NLP, but necessary for the case of large scale uh, news archives. And the research problem is that given very large number of uh, past documents, potentially millions, how to select a small set of, uh, of candidate articles that can contain the correct answer. So, um, I will now describe the, the three steps, um, or perhaps four steps uh, of, of the system. Uh, the first step is uh, estimating time scope of, of the question. So we basically have a question only, like this Lewinsky told whom about her relationship with uh, the President Clinton. As you can see, this is implicit um, 
temporal questions. So there is no temporal expression. That is what we mainly focus on, these kind of questions. And we need to guess basically what is the time period that um, this question could be answered from, where the documents about this question, this event behind the question uh, could be on the archive. So a simple solution is to make a distribution uh, over articles over time, uh, as you can see here for these two example questions, and then uh, make a moving average, which is a, a solid line here out of the um, the distribution shown in a dotted line. And then once we have a moving average, we can uh, find some uh, peak detection, well, uh, find some peaks uh, by applying uh, peak detection methods. And the uh, red dotted line is basically a cutoff line to detect a peak. So the first question generated uh, for us a peak like this, uh, where um, the answer could be somewhere from 98 to to probably the middle of 99. But the second question, which Hollywood star become governor of California, you can see there are two peaks. One is a smaller one, uh, the one on the right side. Uh, so this is more harder case. And the, the blue dot actually indicates when the event happened. So it's, it's um, now uh, these two questions are actually uh, lucky in the sense that we, uh, we could position uh, the time period, the time scope of, of the question uh, to embrace the actual event time. But um, in, in, uh, in reality, the, the question time scope, which we want to basically find, the, the time period, is, is not one only. It, it will be a set of time periods because we can have a lot of peaks. Like you can see these three questions, uh, you can have multiple peaks to four or even more, as the last question uh, shows, which English football team had nine players arrested in Spain for alleged sexual assault. So obviously, uh, we need to represent a question time score as a set of time periods, and this adds to the complexity of uh, finding candidate documents that can uh, provide the answer. So the second step is that uh, once we estimated the time scope of a question, uh, we would like to basically rank uh, documents um, from the viewpoint how they can, how much, uh, how correctly they can provide the answer to the question. So we establish a scores, temporal scores uh, for the documents based on the on the question uh, time scope that was estimated from the first step. Um, I'm sorry, but can you see? Uh, can you see? Maybe I will come back to the to the uh, slideshow. Yes, because something happened here. Yes, we still can see everything. Please, I can. Yes. Uh, yes. So let me skip this slide. So uh, for in this slide, you can see the question type scope uh, is on the left hand side, and we have two documents. So intuitively, um, the document DA, which is closer to this question time scope should have the correct answer, uh, more probably should have the correct answer that, uh, than document DA because it's just closer. So the, the first component of the time scope is, is basically temporal distance. And, and we use here exponential decay that the score of document DA is higher than score of document DB if we have this particular time scope as shown. The second component of the score is using uh, temporal expressions uh, in the documents. Um, you can see that document B have two time expressions which actually fall inside estimated question time scope. So that's why we would assign more uh, value to document DB than document DA. And uh, obviously, this uh, it's simple on the uh, on this visualization, but we may have a variety of temporal expressions. Some of them uh, of granularity of a year, some of them of months, uh, some of them partially overlapping the, the question time scope. So we need some way to to uh, basically aggregate these uh, temporal expressions. We use a kernel density estimation and that considers overlap and granularity of temporal expressions. I will spare all the details, but uh, you can find them in, in the papers um, because there's some mathematics there. And uh, the more complex case is when the time scope is not on the one, as you can see here, but we might have several uh, time periods, uh, so several peaks, and then all, all this aggregation becomes uh, more complex. And uh, the previous slide just showed 
uh, just show the three um, documents which are relevant to the question and the question is uh, on, on the top in the red frame. You can see the question is how many people were killed in Concord crash in 2000. This is explicitly time scope question. We have a year here and uh, the event date is uh, July 25. And you can see these three documents, they actually have temporal expressions uh, like in July 2000 or last year or in 2000, which refer to this time scope. So we consider them as a signals um, to what extent these documents can, uh, can provide us the answer, even though they may have been published uh, quite long even after uh, the event date, after 2000, um, could be even uh, years later, but they may still provide the answer to do the particular question on how many people were killed. Uh, in this uh, accident. So uh, the next uh, step three is uh, uh, combining the, the previous two temporal scores that I introduced and also combining the relevance score of, of a document because we still have a traditional relevance score, how good are documents uh, to the query, how relevant uh, they are to the query and the query is um, collected from, from the question. We can convert the question to the query by picking up uh, some semantics, uh, semantic bearing words uh, from the question. Uh, so we combine the two scores and we have a linear combination of a temporal score and a relevance score. And here this combination is not used with a static alpha, but here we apply some trick. Basically, we have a dynamic combination of the two scores, relevance of a document and temporality of a document. And this uh, score, so this, this weighting factor alpha, it depends on the temporal distribution of, uh, um, of the documents relevant to the question. Basically, if we have uh, one peak as in the top, um, uh, top graph, we provide alpha to be equal to uh, one, which means we don't care about relevance of the documents, but we care only about the temporality because there is only one peak, it's very clear, uh, clean question and probably the, the answer is, is uh, could be found mainly by, by considering uh, time. But if we have many peaks, then the alpha is um, going more towards relevance of a document that is considered rather than their temporality, rather than the closeness to, to these peaks, because we have many peaks, we don't know which one actually is about the event uh, mentioned in the question. So this dynamic combination actually help us to boost much uh, the precision of answers later, as I will show. And finally, once we have some n number of top uh, remind documents, we compute the answer using um, kind of a state-of-the-art or commonly used method called DRQA, which is a system that given uh, documents can answer a question uh, from these documents. But here we provide some small number for example, 50 documents out of the millions, which can provide the answer to our question. And then we choose the most common answer from all these top N documents uh, after uh, processing them by, uh, them by DRQA method. So I will talk now about the uh, experiments. Uh, as I mentioned, we used New York Times that spans about 20 years. And uh, for the test set, since this is completely new problem, there was no existing test set. We couldn't use anything like Squad or uh, Marco, MS Marco. We have to design our own questions, which took us quite much time. We basically uh, collected questions from several sources, from history quizzes, uh, from some history dedicated websites, from Wikipedia, as well as from existing uh, Q&A data sets. Basically, each question has to be considered as a temporal related to the history, and each question needed to be answerable from New York Times. So, about something that is reported in New York Times in this 20 years long period. That's why the, the filtering took quite a long time to, to find such uh, correct questions. They are available for anyone who wants to do research in this direction. Uh, we are now working on automatic generation of such questions using uh, question generation approaches. Um, probably we might have about 100,000 such questions, but there is a lot of filtering because it will be uh, done 
automatically or to some extent semi-automatically. But for this research, we, we picked up uh, manually uh, questions and in total there were 1,000. 500 explicit, uh, 500 implicit uh, time scope questions. And uh, for explicit temporal questions, our system kind of um, achieved uh, the best results um, over two metrics, F1 score and exact match uh, measure. And we compared with two uh, baselines and also with two variants of Kana, which do not have these uh, components like uh, publication date, uh, based temporal scoring and content based temporal scoring. And all these two versions without the components achieved uh, lower results than the full uh, system, which means these components are, are useful. For implicit questions, we also had the best results uh, achieving a couple of percent um, or even more um, improvement in terms of uh, both metrics over uh, some top results. And we also compared our system with uh, Wikipedia. Um, we had a question whether uh, this, uh, this uh, test uh, questions could be answered simply by scanning over Wikipedia and answering, uh, answering them uh, from Wikipedia. But actually, to large extent, uh, kind of was still better than simply using Wikipedia rather, rather than New York Times. Only for this metric in top one, the results were a bit better for Wikipedia, uh, the first row here, than for our system for Kana. And we also tested whether uh, lots of birds or many birds uh, in, in the uh, distribution for a question affect the results. And we found that questions that generate many birds, which should be intuitively more difficult, indeed result in a lower so if a question has many uh, birds, it, it, they, there's a lot of uh, events in the archive that could be uh, related to this question, and then it's just harder to provide correct answer. And the final graph that I want to show you is <clears throat> this um, lots of um, uh, scores over um, alpha component. Uh, if you remember, I talk about dynamic combination of document relevance and a document temporal score. Uh, if we have a just linear combination, uh, the scores would be uh, based on the solid lines, either exact match or F1 score. But if we have this, um, sorry, a dynamic combination rather than static, uh, that's a solid line, uh, we always improve over uh, static combination. So the idea of having alpha changing depending on the distribution depending on the number of births in the, in the distribution was uh, proven to be successful to help us improve the results. So that was the first part of my presentation and I will move to the second part, uh, temporal analog detection. And this is a little bit uh, old uh, from the viewpoint of computer science research. It was done about three, four years ago. So it was before BERT and contextualized um, word embeddings. That's why, of course, there are some ways of improving it. Nevertheless, I, I found it quite interesting and I wanted to uh, share it uh, with you. So what is the background? We think that when users search in the archive, they may have a problem of finding good uh, queries. Basically, there is a, an issue of terminology gap. Uh, Non-experts may not know some correct queries, correct expressions. For example, if a student wants to uh, find some information about music devices uh, that people used to uh, listen to music, and perhaps it might be even 100 years ago, then uh, maybe this, this person may not know good query like phonograph, for example, especially if the, if the user is not an expert. Uh, so. This kind of expressions we would like to provide uh, to the user, basically to improve the search. But uh, finding this kind of analogical terms uh, or related terms is obviously not only for search, it might be for better understanding of archival documents or for knowledge uh, extraction or for educational uh, purposes. And I will show some kind of um, uh, stimulating examples, uh, if we might think what is the past uh, similar analogical uh, thing for the iPod or for USB, 
or uh, for a smartphone, obviously there might be many different answers, but uh, I guess many of you will agree that Walkman probably something similar to iPod because both are um, portable and for listening to music. Floppy disk, something that we used, many of us probably used um, in the past uh, quite commonly is, is also a placeholder for data, same as USBs. And then uh, we can talk about um, similarities of uh, even uh, music bands or perhaps um, leaders of Olympic Committee like Samaranach and, and Rogi. So all these answers, uh, we could probably find them in Wikipedia, um, but uh, not many of them uh, and, and probably only uh, to, to some extent. So there is no such uh, list of analogical terms uh, provided. We would like to mine it from, from the archive. And how we define these temporal analogs, these are entities, terms, uh, which we uh, consider as semantically similar, but which existed in, in different time periods. So the two types of temporal analogs can be, one is uh, the same entity which changed the name. For example, Myanmar and, and Burma, they refer to the same country. And this could be uh, different entities, but uh, quite similar to each other, like iPod and Walkman example, which I uh, showed before. So both of the types of temporal analogs we would like to deliver to the user. For example, the query might be uh, Myanmar, and we would like to answer uh, to the user like Burma, for example, or Walkman and the answer, sorry, iPod and the Walkman uh, would be the answer. So let me show how difficult this problem is. Let's say I want to find a mapping between a Walkman and iPod to establish high similarity between them. If we consider the top co-occurring terms with Walkman in 1980s and top co-occurring terms with iPod in 2010, you can see that uh, quite many terms are different and only one is, is the shared one out of the top uh, common terms. But um, um, this is obviously because everything is changing, especially technology is changing very fast. The problem may seem not to be very easy, but if we look more carefully, we can find some, uh, some relations here, like Sony and Apple, they are companies producing these two devices. Uh, tape and cassette may correspond to MP3 for storing data, and probably many other types of um, analogies uh, we can find. Um, so this is this kind of idea to find correspondences uh, in the data uh, that was uh, driving our, our solution. And how we approach it, uh, we took uh, the archive uh, and divided into time uh, two periods, let's say present time period and past time period. Here, a present time period is from 2003, 2007, just for a very simple reason that our archive was ending in 2007. So we kind of assumed, okay, this is just the present. And we took some period from the past from where we want to find analogs, uh, let's say three years, four years, um, somewhere at the end of 80s. What we did for all these two collections of documents, we trained uh, where to vec um, uh, embeddings, and we have matrix of word embeddings uh, over different dimensions for these two collections. It was, of course, done separately, separately training for present and separately for past time. And then uh, what we want is to establish some connection between these two um, embeddings, between these two vector spaces. So the idea here, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, in the case of correspondences, is that um, we would like to retain some kind of relative positions of uh, similar uh, terms, similar words in, in the vector spaces. Like Walkman to cassette should be more or less similar in the position to iPod and to MP3 uh, in the present and, and so on. So this could be done in a linear way by some sort of a transformation. We transform from one vector space from present to the past vector space. And we, for the first uh, approach, we, we proposed a simple transformation, linear one, where we have this transformation matrix, which basically maps uh, dimensions from the present to dimensions from the past. And once we have this matrix, we could later convert any word from the present to um, the vector uh, of similar words uh, in the past. 
basically find such similar words uh, in the past uh, to the query vector uh, from the present. Of course, how to find this transformation matrix is not easy task. We uh, need to optimize this uh, equation here, a um, uh, minimization uh, equation. But um, to do it, uh, we need a lot of training instances. We basically need a lot of pairs of terms, such as Walkman, iPod, Myanmar, Burma, and so on. Terms which used to mean the same, uh, but one comes from the present and the other comes uh, from the past. Obviously, having many such terms is very difficult, uh, especially as we may have different time periods, different type of languages, and so on. So we used here a trick which basically allowed the methods to work. The trick is that we used um, very common terms like water, men, women, and so on. And we assumed they mean the same. And this is not only our idea. This is also supported by uh, studies uh, of um, historical linguistics, which say that terms that are very frequent are slowest to change their meaning. Basically, probably lots of people use these terms, uh, they are frequent, and, and that's why the, the semantic drift goes uh, quite slowly compared to less uh, frequently used terms. So we simply assume that men uh, was meaning the same in the past as now, women, water, and let's say a couple of thousand of other very common terms, frequently used terms. And with this, uh, weak supervision, we could populate the transformation matrix, uh, find uh, all the values for this matrix. And then once we had the matrix, uh, we could take a query, let's say uh, the word iPod, which is um, reflected by uh, embedding vector of 300 dimensions. We could uh, multiply it by transformation matrix, perhaps 300 by 200 dimensions to obtain some kind of expected vector in the uh, past a vector space. So basically, this is just a point in the space in the past. But if we use cosine similarity and compare this vector, uh, which we just obtained, uh, with all the vocabulary in the past, we can find uh, similar uh, words. We can rank them. For example, Walkman might be uh, somewhere hopeful at the top. And as you can see, the result here is not one answer, but is a ranked list of temporal analogs. So we assume that it's difficult to find one-to-one -one matching. Uh, obviously, history is quite different from the present, but we could at least provide some ranked list of terms. And those at the top should be um, temporal analogs or likely temporal analogs more than uh, terms somewhere in the middle of the list or at the bottom of the list. So that is more IR style approach, uh, just to be more uh, embracing and considering that uh, everything changes, we can't have one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, only in ideal cases, perhaps. But uh, what we found that this approach was not working well because it's a kind of global term transformation. For example, VCR was on the top or Macintosh just because uh, both uh, Macintosh and iPod are produced by Apple and VCR and iPod uh, allow to record and playback. So they were not the best answers, uh, mainly because this is some kind of global correspondence. Then we considered that a new method had to be proposed to uh, improve, which will consider more um, smaller scale relations, local relations between query and the context. We call it local correspondence. And this method, uh, just to briefly explain it, uh, we take the query and now we find some top, um, top relevant uh, terms to the query. We call it reference points or reference terms. Uh, let's say music, Apple, device, and iPod. And these terms help to sort of locate the meaning of iPod. And then uh, we do it in the past, uh, actually the same. Uh, we take some candidates, uh, perhaps the ones obtained from a previous method, global correspondence methods. And, and for each of them, we also find these reference points. And then now uh, what we need to do is uh, kind of do graph matching. So basically find the most similar graphs out of these past uh, candidates and basically rerun the words. Perhaps now Walkman will be on the top rather than VCR because we consider 
these reference points, reference terms, and how similar they are to the reference terms for the um, query for the present term. And uh, the problem here is how to find these reference terms. We, we provide three criteria. The terms should be related to the query. They should be general, nothing really specific, detailed. They should be independent from each other. And uh, for each of these criteria, we propose uh, several methods. I will not go into detail, but we used uh, term coherence. We used um, hyperneme extraction. We also did clustering just to satisfy the three criteria of picking up good uh, reference terms. For example, for iPod, um, we could find like music, Apple, computer, digital iTunes by coherence or music, music device, music player by hypernames and by clustering um, to ensure that the terms mean different things. We have music, digital, iTunes, company store. And then we tested um, all these variants later in the experiment. Basically, we found that uh, the hypernames perform the best because they capture some sort of um, higher level uh, information, um, categoric, cater, categorical information about the entity like iPod. Anyway, once we have these terms, we could do the matching uh, by comparing um, embeddings of each term, but also the difference between terms here, which is the relation. So Sony to Walkman should be similar as, as Apple to iPod. We call it relational similarity, not only um, conceptual similarity, which would be just Apple to Sony comparison or iPod to Walkman. Of course, here, each of these uh, similarities is also um, done with transformation. So we transform the Apple to, to the past uh, vector space and compare with the word Sony. We do the same for iPod and Walkman and all the terms as well as the relation of Apple to iPod is uh, computed and transformed to the past vector space to be compared with relations Sony to Walkman. We use some optimization methods here, but I will um, spare these details. You can find them in the paper. And I will just move to the experiments. Uh, we use the same uh, corpus as before, New York Times uh, annotated uh, corpus. But now we only uh, use some time periods from it. Um, for example, we use this 2000 to 2007 as the present. And the past period was from 87 to 91. Each of these uh, time periods contained still about uh, half a million news articles. And uh, we uh, train transformation matrix uh, using 5% uh, of the top common frequent terms. And uh, we provided also a test set. Again, this is a new problem, so there is no, um, there was at least at the time no a set of terms which would be analogical over time. We tried to pick up such terms using Wikipedia, search engines, um, and also some historical books. Uh, we provided uh, 52 queries um, and 95 pairs of query temporal analog. Like you can see examples here, 20 examples. And uh, there were persons, locations, objects. Um, this test set is also published. It can be used, for example, the Putin um, is, uh, is associated with Yeltsin, Chirac, Mitterrand, iPod, Walkman, and, and many other things like email, messages, letters, mail, fax. As you can see, sometimes there are several passwords which correspond to one word, like in the case of email here. And then uh, in the results, we found that this local transformation, uh, like LT, uh, was performing the best, uh, better than global transformation. So finding reference, reference terms was helpful. And the baselines, like um, bug of words or LSI and uh, hidden Markov model, uh, were performing worse on this uh, test set both uh, by searching from present to the past, but also from past uh, to the present. And you can see examples here. Uh, in, the, in the column, the green column, we have the query. And then we have a correct answer, run truth answer in the next column. And the red, uh, red colored columns are uh, ranks by baselines. And uh, the blue color uh, column are uh, ranks uh, 
of correct terms given by our uh, methods. So you can see, like for example, Putin um, as a query uh, should produce Yeltsin, and for bug of words, uh, Yeltsin was really somewhere somewhere in the middle of the list, less than thousand um, rank. Uh, the other baseline LSI put it on the fifty-first rank while our two methods put it on the 24th rank and in local transformation, even uh, very close to the top, like on the second position. So on average, we managed to put these uh, correct terms much higher in the ranked list of, of answers than the baselines, especially bug of words was really not good here. <clears throat> and uh, we also tested the number of these common frequent terms which, uh, if you um, probably remember, are the terms that we assumed uh, they mean the same, like men, women, water. There was a simple trick to, to basically um, provide weak supervision for training the matrix, and it helped to, um, to solve the problem. And we found that 5% of the top common terms uh, are, are enough to, to have the best results. And uh, some more solutions that we provided is uh, OCR correction. We found many words uh, are incorrectly uh, detected by OCR. Um, as you know, this is a big problem. For example, the vector space from 1906 to 1950. Uh, we also use uh, Times Archive. That's why we could have a uh, longer time. You can see there are many uh, incorrect words. And in order to map uh, correct form of a word to uh, incorrect uh, spelling, we used a very simple technique uh, based on uh, looking at the embedding vector, uh, considering uh, which word is dominant. Uh, for example, the letter here is more dominant. We can see 85,000 times it appears, while the incorrect words are less uh, frequent and also considering one edit distance between these words. So by this, we could map all these incorrect words like letter um, and, and so on to the correct letter using these three simple um, rules. And then, as you can see at the bottom, uh, if we have error correction, uh, we could provide answer to the query car, which is like vehicle, tricycle, motor, car cycles from this past period, uh, which is better than the results um, derived from a row a method that doesn't use OCR correction. So a simple improvement uh, by OCR um, error elimination allowed us to have better results. And here is some demo system that we also built. User could type a query, like you can see Euro here, and the results are uh, francs, Belgium francs, Lire, these are the, the previous currencies, um, Zlotis, which is actually an error. Um, but uh, you can see some good results are delivered for the uh, query. We can also see an uh, example of a sentence containing um, the answers. And um, another thing which we provided here uh, is the ask vector. So we provide the, the additional meaning to the query, because Euro could mean Euro Cup or currency, but if we specify this aspect term, we can better position the, the actual meaning, and, and this is some improvement of our, of our method. Um, and now, this is the, the uh, second part of temporal analog, um, which is much shorter. Uh, it's about explanation of terms. Because if we have a counterpart of a term, we often would like to know why these two terms are similar, why iPod is similar to the Walkman. And this is more explanation task than uh, detection. Um, how we solve it, we basically try to find pairs of terms like music here, portable, MP3 cassette, Apple Sony, pairs of terms which will uh, somehow provide a clue why the, the iPod and Walkman could be considered as temporal analogs. So we didn't provide some full definition, full sentence, but at least some kind of indicators as a pair of terms, which could help to um, understand the, the relation of iPod and Walkman. So this was another task. And the problem here is that given some set of words that co-occur with iPod and set of words that co-occur with Walkman, we want to deliver uh, pairs 
where one term comes from the iPod context terms, the other from Walkman context terms, but both of them somehow uh, correspond to each other and provide uh, explanation why iPod and Walkman are, are similar, are considered to be similar, like uh, music devices, portable, produced by two companies, and, and so on. So um, for this task, uh, I will just very briefly show how we solve it. Let's say we have the query, which is iPod and Walkman. We want for these two uh, words, provide the explanation why they are similar. And you can see on the left a good uh, term, MP3 cassette. This is something we want to return. And a bad uh, term, which is man and the city that doesn't provide any explanation why iPod is similar to the Walkman. And how we could find these terms out of uh, hundreds of terms that could be uh, positioned in, in such a pair. So we use very simple three rules. One is a relatedness that uh, MP3 should be related to iPod and also cassette to Walkman, which is not so much in the case of a man to iPod and city to Walkman. Somehow they might be related, but not so much as these collect uh, terms, MP3 and, and cassette. So that's relatedness. A second is semantic similarity, which means that cassette to MP3 should be similar. Okay, both of them uh, contain data, they are data holders. While in the case of men and the city, they are not necessarily semantically similar. And final case is relational similarity. So the relation between iPod and MP3 should be similar as the one of Walkman and Cassette, which for the case of iPod Man and Walkman and the City is not the case, right? So three simple criteria, which could be combined into one, uh, one equation, three scores of each one corresponding to the point in the criteria. And then we can uh, rank the pairs of terms to, to provide um, good terms for explanation. Uh, we also use another method, global method here, which is based on the graph, random work on the graph, but I will uh, leave it for those who are interested, you can read uh, in the paper. And then uh, we also did some experiments here. Uh, we found again that the global method is performing the best um, for precision recall and F-score, then uh, baselines and even then the, the local method, uh, which is not using uh, graph processing. And some example of, uh, of the results here, uh, for example, when we compare Arnold Schwarzenegger from the past and Arnold Schwarzenegger from the present, okay, it's the same entity, but we still compare it in two different times. We can uh, deliver this kind of explanatory terms uh, by our methods. Um, you might be wondering why Bustamante and Stallone. So uh, his main competitor um, in the uh, in the time when uh, Schwarzenegger was just an actor, was of course Stallone. But when uh, Schwarzenegger became uh, governor of California, the other competitor he had was a political person, uh, Bustamante. I think he's a Democrat. Uh, that's why these two terms were delivered. Californians, moviegoers, that also mean something. Okay, there is an error here, but basically Hollywood, Hollywood, because he still uh, was an actor at the time of being a governor and so on. And then we also pick up some uh, sentences which contain one of the terms like Bustamante and the, the query in the, in the present and um, the term from the past like Stallone and the query in the past to provide some explanation um, what these terms can mean. Of course, selection of these sentences is also a data-driven, it's not random. <clears throat> so this is the last part of my um, presentation, which will be very short, it's about some interactive systems uh, that I built uh, in the context of, of this research. Uh, the first one is for uh, semantic uh, evolution analysis of words. So, um, for example, we might have a term like a mail, um, like email or mail, and we want to see how it changed over time. So in our system, we use uh, Google Books uh, as well as uh, Koha, which is a corpus of historical American English. And then, as you can see on the first um, um, first uh, figure on the left, uh, we generate a couple of graphs. 
Uh, one is a uh, similarity of the meaning of the uh, word male uh, in 2000 compared to, uh, the, sorry, uh, to the previous um, uh, decades. And then the frequency over time, this is all generated on the fly. You can also have a time period selection uh, and many other things like um, Pearson correlation or Jacquard similarity instead of cosine similarity and so on. In the second figure in the middle, you can compare the word like mouse and another query word like red, for example, for their similarity over time. Again, generate some similarity plot between these two terms and um, some other uh, filtering uh, criteria here. Uh, then on the figure on the top uh, right, you can see the word cloud uh, for the query science. We basically find many co-carrying terms like art, modern literature, and we also show how these contextual terms uh, change over time. Uh, basically, how their frequency changes over time, so we can better understand uh, how science, uh, the, the query term, was actually uh, changing. And we also have this uh, term tree, as you can see at the um, right-hand side at the bottom, that you can see what terms were after science like science and technology or science of something. And there are also a lot of temporal information that you invert. So this is the system that is working uh, online. You can uh, access this URL on the top and issue any query and, and generate all these um, things based on Google Books, uh, English um, Data and Koha, the uh, historical corpus. Uh, the second system was built for analyzing archival documents. So let's say I have a text like this one, which is actually from uh, Sherlock Holmes, a book, and we basically estimate the age of this uh, document simply by looking at engrams and uh, checking uh, how the engrams appeared in, in Google, uh, Google engrams data. So for example, we can find that this document was probably made, written somewhere in 1920s or 1930s, because many engrams here um, are very popular in this time when we use uh, Google Books engram data. And then we can have more information about age estimation, um, which engrams appeared for the first time, uh, to provide some more reasoning when this term, uh, when, when this content uh, could have been uh, written. Um, so this is example of a system for analyzing uh, what, what is the date of, of a given text. We just copy and paste some text in the field here, and then we can generate all these evidences uh, why it, it could have been published in 1930 or 1907, which, which engrams um, could, uh, could be uh, the evidence for it, what is the, the, the peak um, of engrams uh, that, that are the most popular. Uh, and, and so on. And um, this is the last uh, part of, of, of the demo that I want to show. We can also uh, map the age of words uh, uh, by some visual way. For example, if I put this text here, we can generate red colors, uh, red, red background colors for terms or engrams which existed for a long time. For example, something like world or of, of his are very long long existing uh, terms but something like um, questionable memory or distracting factor they appeared in the language more recently uh, of course based on the google engrams data and then we can color all this uh, in a particular way and then user can click and, and see a frequency of a particular word like software for example over time and some engrams which constitute it uh, as well. And uh, we can also have a visualization of semantic change of words, um, the, the similarity to the, to the present time. So the word like, uh, for example, I don't know, hair under, it's probably the, the meaning still is the same, but if we have the, the term like dubious or finally, they change more over time. Uh, or name entity like Adler, obviously, it also changes. And we can visualize this semantic uh, similarity uh, on, the, on the text itself. 
And user can also click on something like software and see similarity over time uh, to, the, to the current decade. So um, let me conclude. Um, what I show today was um, basically research towards finding new ways of information access and extracting knowledge from archives, especially news archives. And I, uh, in particular, I show three uh, research topics, uh, question answering in uh, news archives was the first one. The second was finding temporal analogs and also explaining why two terms could be considered as temporal analogs. And we used uh, global and local uh, approaches for it. And the last uh, topic that I show today was uh, some snapshots of interactive systems that we build for um, understanding evolution of, of words over time and also understanding uh, archival documents, uh, when they were published, uh, how old uh, terms they contain, um, like obsolete terms or maybe newly formed terms, and basically have some more uh, context given to analysis of um, archival documents. So I will finish here. I'm, I'm sorry for um, putting everything, lots of probably content in a, in a short uh, time and, and speaking fast, but I hope you understood the main uh, direction of this research. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer now or, or by email later. Dziękujemy bardzo, Adamie. Wirtualne brawa 